We have a wonderful opportunity right now at this time. Excuse me one sec. You guys got that paper? <laughs> wonderful. I'd like to uh, invite down Kate and TJ. And uh, we have a wonderful opportunity here as a church to install um, some brand new deacons. And so you understand, our church is ruled by uh, elders of the church that are, that are brought forth from the congregation. They serve as ruling elders for the body. And particular churches of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church as they're governed by the session or the elders, may also have a board of deacons under authority of the session, and they carry out specific duties assigned by the session. According to Scripture, those who bear the office of deacon should especially exhibit spiritual qualities of a Christian and should be steady and reliable. The first duty of a deacon is is sympathy and service. Together, the board of deacons carries out the ministry of compassion. As the law of love places certain duties upon each Christian, the deacon is especially bound to fulfill these duties and is to be an example to all. Yeah, no pressure, right? <laughs> Kate and TJ expressed throughout this past year and a half, almost two years, uh, a desire to serve the Lord in a deeper way, and, uh, and truly a, a sense of calling of, of how much more can we do for serving. And as the elders talked with both of them, uh, it just became clear that the Lord was, was setting them apart in many ways to, to serve the body. And that's what, that's what this ordinating means. This ordination is setting apart for the purpose of ministry and service. So Kate and TJ, come a little closer. We, we've had COVID, so we're all good, like right here. Um, I, have, I have several questions to ask them. And then you, congregation, I have questions to ask you because this is a partnering relationship. This is a working together relationship. We together are agreeing and setting them apart for the service of the Lord. So let me ask you these questions first. Do you reaffirm your faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Wonderful. Do you believe the scriptures, the Old and the New Testament, to be the Word of God? And flipping over the page. Totally trustworthy, fully inspired by the Holy Spirit the supreme and final, the only infallible rule of faith and practice. Wonderful. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the Westminster Confession of Faith, the catechisms of this church, as containing a system of doctrine taught in the Holy Scriptures? Do you promise that if at any time you find yourself out of accord with this system of doctrine as taught in the Scriptures, and is contained in the Westminster Confession of Faith and the Catechisms of this Church, you will, by your own initiative, make known to the Church session the change in which has taken place since you've assumed these views. Wonderful. Do you affirm and adopt the essentials of the faith without exception? Good. Do you subscribe to the government and the discipline of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church? Do you promise to... Sub to, do you promise subjection to your fellow officers in the Lord? Have you been induced, as far as you know in your heart, to accept the office of deacon from a love of God and a sincere desire to promote His glory in the gospel of His Son? Wonderful. Do you promise to be zealous and faithful in promoting the truths of the gospel and the purity and peace of the church, whatever persecution or opposition may come your way on that account. Wonderful. Will you seek to be faithful and diligent in the exercises of all of your duties as deacons 
whether personal or relative, private or public, and to endeavor by the grace of God to adorn the profession of, of the gospel in your manner of life, and to walk with exemplary piety before this congregation of which God is now calling you to be an officer. Amen. Wonderful. Are you willing, this is the last one, are you willing to take responsibility in the life of the congregation as deacons, and will you seek to discharge your duties, relying upon the grace of God in such a way that the entire church of Jesus Christ will be blessed? Okay, wonderful. These are pretty epic questions that they're being asked. But congregation, this is where we participate in setting them aside. Do you, the members of this congregation, continue to receive these persons, Kate and TJ Brewer, as deacons, and do you continue to promise to yield to them and to all of, all of your officers in the honor and encouragement and obedience in the Lord to which ordination of these officers entitles them? According to the word of God and the constitution of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church, if so, say yes. 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 Wonderful. Notice we don't do any notes, so it's good. We will, uh, we will do this again in our second service, and then I will do the final part of installation at the second service as well. But so you all see, we do have these wonderful little uh, EPC lapel pens for them, as uh, I had an opportunity to give one to our new elder, new ruling elder. I give one now to each one of you. And may the Lord bless you as you serve him. I want you both to come over here. Kneeling down might be difficult, but just stand here and we're going to pray over you. Uh, Brian, could you come and, and join me in this, brother? Congregation, let's pray for our new deacons and rejoice in the Lord. Father, we give you thanks and praise for the work that you are doing in the hearts of your congregation. Now you have called T Kate and TJ out to serve you in this way. And we set them apart in our hearts, in our minds, and in our support, in our prayers. And Lord God, may you use them in mighty ways to love the community of the church, to care for them, and to watch over them. And Lord, we know that this is a mighty task that two people are not enough for. So Lord God, my heart is that I pray for more to be called to this great service. And I pray also, Lord, that we all together will serve together with them and be encouraged and inspired by their love and care for the body of Christ. We pray your blessing upon their marriage, Lord God, and upon their service unto you. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Let's all welcome them. God bless you both. God bless you. Asking God to make us all servants. Call us all. So stand together as we sing one, one time through, Make Me a Servant. Good morning, everyone. Who's ready to read the Word of God? 
Are you ready? Come now. We, we are here before the very presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're encouraged to read His revelation, His revealed Word to us. So I'll ask you again, who's ready to read the Word of God? Amen. Amen. All right, if you are ready, then stand with me and let's hear the Word of God being read. We're in Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 2. And after six days, Jesus took with Him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses. And they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, and for they were very afraid. And the cloud, and a cloud overshadowed them, and the voice out of that cloud said, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, They no longer saw anyone with them, but Jesus only. And as they were coming down from the mountain, he charged them to tell no one of what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what the rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, Why do the scribes say that First, Elijah must come. And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And now is it, and, and how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it was written of him. You may be seated. Lord, bless us for the reading of His Word. Father in Heaven, as we come before You and Your Holy Word this morning, we are so grateful for Your presence here with us. The You, O mighty God, O King of the universe, condescended at one point in time to come down and become one of us. As we're told in Philippians chapter 2, You emptied Yourself. And you became one of us in obedience even to the point of death, death upon a cross. And Lord, right now, as we come, we just pray, O God, that You and Your holiness and Your righteousness would condescend to us once again because of the love and the provision of Jesus Christ. Look over our sins, O God. See them already paid upon the cross of Christ. We claim Him and Him alone is our sacrifice and we thank You, O God, for that provision that came by Your own hand in which You promised through Abraham that God Himself would provide the Lamb. And You did. And so, Lord, as we come and we praise You today and we study Your Word and we hear it preached and we hear it read, Lord, draw us closer into Your presence. We ask, Lord, Your forgiveness of our sins. We ask, Lord, for clarity of hearts and minds as we now come. We pray for those who in our midst are still sick from COVID and from many other things that might need surgery, might need healing, might need emotional, mental, physical strength. Lord, we pray that You would restore our hearts and minds during this time, that we would be a balm to one another. We pray for those missionaries that are around the whole world, O God, proclaiming Your name, particularly those who are in persecuted areas. We lift them up to You today. We remember Dave and Deb Walker today, Lord, as they serve You in the Far East, 
And we pray, O oh God, that you would use them in mighty ways for your kingdom and for your glory. But we pray for Dave right now, Lord, at the loss of his mother. And he wasn't able to leave because of COVID. He wasn't able to fly, even though he had everything all set. Lord, our heart breaks with him. And we just ask, Lord, that you would lift him and Deb up today and bless them both. Give them strength that they would continue on and give them peace about his mother. Father in heaven, we also pray that you would bless our offerings and our tithes as we give them today in the basket. Lord, may you use that for the furthering of your kingdom. And right now, Lord, may your spirit bring us together according to your word and in the power of your word that we would be changed, transformed, uplifted and illuminated by the person of Jesus Christ. We pray this in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. This morning, what we read in the scripture is a preview of the resurrection. It's a preview of what these disciples themselves would personally see. Now, how is it a preview? God, for a moment, for a moment, allowed all of his beauty in his glory to shine and to shine forth. From Jesus Christ. He himself brings forth this very glow that amazes these men. Now, when I go to the movies, when I can go to the movies, I love previews. Anybody else love previews? I feel like I've missed the whole show if I didn't get there before the previews. Because I love seeing what coming attractions are going to happen next. What movies are coming down the pike. I can, I can even talk with my family because the lights aren't completely down. And we'll say, oh, that looks like a stinker. Or, oh, can't wait for that one. And some, have you noticed some previews are, are very brief. And you go, wow, that, was, that didn't tell me much about the movie at all. I don't even know if I'd want to go see it. Others will begin to tell the story and you think, Wow, when will this trailer end? I feel like I've seen the whole movie. Has that happened? And then you'll see some, and as you see them, you go, um, you know, I think I just saw all the funniest parts of that whole movie. And sure enough, when you see the movie, you've seen all the funny parts. Well, in this moment, as I said, Jesus gives his disciples a glimpse of resurrection. A glimpse of his divine power. We see a preview of Jesus' resurrection power and the manifestation of his divine glory as he's transfigured, which confirms also, confirms the law and the words of the prophets, but they gave a special revelation to his disciples at this moment. Now, why am I bringing up this transfiguration? Well, it just so happens to be Transfiguration Sunday. Did you guys know that? You're probably all prepared for Valentine's Day. But it's Transfiguration Sunday. And I thought, this is perfect, because what is happening here is a beginning of a change in the ministry, in the life of the disciples, but especially in the purpose of Jesus Christ. He reveals himself to his disciples at this very critical moment. And why was it a critical moment? Well, he and his disciples had traveled to Caesarea Philippi. And Caesarea Philippi is filled with a large temple to Pan and to many other gods. And it was in that place, as we look up further in Mark, in Mark chapter 8, that there is the place in which Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, who do you say I am? Well, at first he says, who do people say I am? And they, he gets John the Baptist, and he gets uh, Elijah, he gets prophets, he gets all these different things. And then Peter says what? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for it is the Father in heaven who gave you that. And then he begins to talk about the resurrection and he begins to talk about his own death. And Peter starts to get really uncomfortable with what he's talking about. And at one point in time, he even tells the Lord, Shh, stop talking.
talking about the death stuff. And what does Jesus respond? Get behind me, Satan. And rebukes him. Here he praises him, then he rebukes him. We see Peter in the Spirit speaking forth of who Jesus Christ is. And then Peter in the flesh saying, hey, let's not talk about death. You're a king. But this idea of death would remain upon this group, these these disciples, even as they traveled down from that Galilee area in the north where Caesarea Philippi was in that magnificent moment of proclamation of who Jesus is. As they would travel down, there would still be this dark cloud over them of death. And as they get about six days away, Jesus takes three of his disciples, his close three, John and James, the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder, and Peter. He takes the three of them and takes them up high on a mountain. It's this place up high on this mountain in which his glory is revealed to them as he is transfigured before their very presence. And this is the moment that we learn some amazing things of the Lord. Let me see if I can get my thing working here. Uh, If you click to the next one, please. Wonderful. The first thing that we see is that Jesus is the very source of divine glory. Jesus is the very source of divine glory. Matthew and Luke, the Synoptic Gospels with Mark, all have this account of Jesus' transfiguration, but with different little details added in. Matthew adds this in, not only does Jesus' presence change, as as we read here in verse 2, he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. Now, we can get a sense of that kind of whiteness because of today, can't we? Even driving here, we're actually glad that we got here at the early service because later it's going to be blinding. The sun radiating off of the whiteness of the snow. Imagine how at this moment, Jesus Christ is glowing so much from the radiance of His glory that His own clothing becomes unbleachably white. Incredibly so. Matthew 17, 2 says that also His face shone like the sun. Luke says that His face was altered and His clothing was dazzlingly white. At this very moment, what is used for the word transfigured or um, this word for transfigured is metamorpho. Metamorpho comes from the word that we use for metamorphosis. And you might remember that from your fifth grade science class as you watched a little caterpillar build a cocoon. And soon what would come out of that cocoon, that chrysalis? A butterfly transformed, metamorphosis happening within that little cocoon, changing and transforming completely from one thing to another. And that's what Mark captures here. The Jesus in that moment was transformed from one thing to another. There was a metamorphosis that took place, a transformation. And what was truly happening in many ways, was the greatest theophany in all of human history. See, a theophany is an appearing of God before man. But God had done this in many different ways. With Abraham, he was a fiery pot coming and going through the very sacrifice of covenant that God would establish with Abraham. With With Moses, he was a burning bush, not being consumed, and yet that drew Moses to him. And and as he came near, he was very afraid. Finally, we also remember when Moses declared to the Lord, show me your glory. What a 
What an amazing thing to ask of God. Show me your glory. And so God says, okay, I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock. No man can see my face and live. I'll put you in the cleft of the rock. I'll cover you with my hand. And I'll let my backside pass by you. And only a glimpse of the backside of God passing before him in all of his goodness, declaring his mercies and his grace. And what happens to Moses? You guys remember? He is glowing. By that short time in the presence of God's glory, he is glowing. And what is this word glory? Let's talk about this for a second. Because often we'll talk about we are here to glorify God and enjoy him forever. So part of our duty and our responsibility and our true existence as human beings is to give God glory. Well, what does that mean? That means to give Him praise. That means to give Him adoration, concentration, focus of our hearts and minds. That means to put all things to Him for goodness and and purpose. To be able to turn to Him and say, Lord God, You are wonderful. As we watch in the football games as somebody scores a touchdown and everybody cheers. That is giving glory. And something that we should be doing moment by moment every single time we take a breath or our heart beats. But even more so when God does amazing things in our lives. We should be giving God glory. But glory in this context is different. Glory in the context of God Himself, as Jesus Christ Himself, is the manifestation. It's the visual truth of His goodness, His righteousness, His beauty, His power. Being made manifest. So right now when I'm talking about glory, I'm talking about He's letting it shine. He's peeling back the human curtain, and allowing the divine to come through. Jesus right here is the very source of divine glory. This is the greatest theophany ever. Why? Because at other times there was glimpses. At other times there was other objects. But here, right here, is the Son of God showing forth who He is in His beauty. Notice the brightness. This This brings back many understandings that would be in the Jewish mind of this glory and this brightness comes only from one and is described very clearly as we think about the Son of Man imagery that's being used here. What does this mean, the Son of Man? We think of that and we hear that word and we go, oh, that means that Jesus was saying, hey, I was born of a person. I identify with humanity. Well, That's partially right. He did identify with humanity. He was born of a woman, born of the Holy Spirit. But he himself, even though he identified with humanity, he was also fully God. So that capturing that moniker of Son of Man doesn't quite capture just that he identifies with us. Some have said that, well, it was just an expression that he liked to use to to say of himself. And you'll see that all through Matthew and Mark and Luke. But it's more than that because he's saying this with a purpose. This brings us all the way back to Daniel, the prophet. Daniel chapter 7. When one like a son of man does what? Comes before the ancient of days, he describes here. Let me read this to you. It is amazing. God peels back, peels back the universe and shows into the depths of heaven. It says this in Daniel chapter 7, As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and his hair on his head was pure as wool, and his throne was of fiery flames, its wheels burning bright like fire. Now, who does that sound like as we turn back to the transfiguration? It sounds like the brightness and the glory because here Daniel is seeing the brightness and the glory of God Himself. And then another figure comes on the scene in verse 13. I saw in the night visions 
And behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man. He came to the Ancient of Days and was presented to him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. And all peoples, nations, and languages would serve him. His dominion in, is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Who is this? This is the Son of Man. Now that very example, that very proclamation by the prophet came to be in the Jewish mind when you said Son of Man, that's who you're talking about. You're talking about the one who's coming, who is Messiah, who will have upon him all the shoulder of the governments, that he himself will be a king, that he'll be given rules and, and power and dominion and authority all upon him. And notice what we're seeing as we see Christ Jesus. The proclamations that were made of him. All the prophecies that were fulfilled in Christ Jesus. That he himself is the very radiance of God. In fact, the description of the Ancient of Days, what happens at the Transfiguration? Christ Himself is the one with brightness of face like the sun and is glowing brightly. We also see this again in Revelation. As the Son of Man walks within the lampstands and each one of them represents the churches, He's a beautiful description. Let me see. Let me uh, read this to you right now. I saw even seven golden lampstands. This is Revelation 1, 12. And in the midst of the lampstands was one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs on his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like fire flames of fire and his feet were like burnished bronze refined in the furnace and his voice was like the roar of many waters that is Christ Jesus resurrected re always with his eternal home and his kingdom and his power all revealed at this one moment as John sees also the peeling back of reality to the truth of heaven. Right here we understand that Jesus is the very source of divine glory. And as we're told in Philippians, Philippians chapter 2, that, that Jesus emptied himself. Let me read this. Have this in mind among you, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form. He humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That very idea that Jesus was empty, well, what did he empty himself of? Glory. Imagine if he'd been born in that stable with his glory shining that day. Imagine how the shepherds would not have needed sheep because there would have been a bright shining sun coming from Bethlehem. Imagine if he'd walked every single day upon the earth allowing his brightness to shine. Not a man could live, we're told, because they would be beholding the very face of God, the very glory of God. You think people would have been drawn to him if he had been glowing like that? Probably, but probably for the wrong reasons. Yes, many would probably have even run away. But what did God do in his sovereignty and his wisdom? He clothed himself as one of us. He became one of us. And emptied himself of what truly belonged to him. His glory. His glory should always be shown, should always be seen, but he veiled it so that we would be blessed. Well, moving on from this, also comes down a dark cloud. 
a dark cloud descends among them. And from that very dark cloud, we hear a voice. It says in verse 7, and a cloud overshadowed them. Remember Sinai? What came down upon the mountain at Mount Sinai when Moses received the Ten Commandments? A dark cloud. So there too also is the very presence of God in His glory coming down as we see upon Mount Sinai, as we see upon the tabernacle, as we see upon the, the temple when, it's, when the Ark of the Covenant comes in. In 1 Kings chapter 8, we see that, that this bringing down and this glory kept everyone from even coming near the temple. They couldn't come near the tabernacle. And they, when they saw the mountain and the cloud came down, they couldn't go near it as well. They knew that this moment, when this cloud would come down, this dark cloud, yet it was bright and fiery and powerful, was the very presence of God as well. So in this moment, we have not only the transformation of Jesus and His glory just shining forth, But we also have the very powerful, dark presence of the Father there at this moment. Confirming we have glory all around. Can you imagine why Peter was like, hey, it's good that we're here. This is amazing. Talk about a mountaintop experience, right? They were changed. In fact, Hebrews chapter 1 Verse 3 says that Jesus Christ is the radiance of the glory of God. You can go to the next one, please. Well, we also see that in this moment, as we're understanding what's going on in this transfiguration, why why did he do this? What, What was his purpose? Well, the disciples were right there to witness this. And what did they witness? Well, they witnessed the very that Jesus is proclaimed as divine. And this was an important moment because remember the dark cloud that was kind of over them, not that Shekinah glory kind of cloud, but that dark cloud of death. And Jesus takes these three and says, let me show you something. Let me show you something of what is to come. He begins to show the greater power and majesty of Christ. And why that death is one that is not going to hold him. Why? Because he is also divine. And the very presence of Elijah and Moses uh, Moses helped to affirm this. With them, Elijah and Moses, they were talking to Jesus, it says in verse 4. And Elijah signifies the prophets, those who spoke for the Lord to the people, represents all those who saw Christ coming and proclaimed Him. And now Elijah himself, who was taken up into heaven, physically, is now returned, deposited back in the promised land to the very face of the one whom he had proclaimed and he had seen by the visions of God. Talk about a powerful moment for Elijah. He got to be in the very presence of Messiah that he was always proclaiming, hoping for. Go ahead and click. Moses as well. Moses was the one who who even asked the Lord, show me your glory, but he also signifies the very law, the moral, ceremonial, Levitical, sacrificial, all the laws that God had given to man. All the laws that God had given specifically to the people of Israel, that they would understand what sacrifice is that they would understand what it means to worship a holy and righteous God. And not an idol, but a God who is unseen. And a God who is everywhere. And a God who knows everything. It was a God like no other God. And through Moses and the law came the understanding of even our sinfulness. Our sin that drives us to some some saving grace. And God provide that through the sacrificial system, that saving grace that would overlook their sin for a time and overlook their sin for a time until Messiah would come and fully and completely pay for that sin. The law was represented there as Moses came. 
We just talked about Moses. We talked about Joshua going to the promised land. Who was not there at the promised land? Moses, right? He couldn't even step in. But look at what God did. In the presence of Messiah, God takes Moses and, as R.C. Sproul says, doesn't horizontally move him there, but vertically drops him there. So Moses gets to stand in the promised land with the Messiah, the one who would be a prophet just like Moses. He got to speak to. He got to enjoy. He got to entreat. He got to speak with. And then these two are witnesses of who Jesus is, and they are proclaiming His divine, His divinity, just by their presence but also God the Father. We spoke of Him in this dark cloud. He says, this is my beloved Son. Three times God has spoken in the Gospels. Have you ever noticed that? There's only three times that God has spoken, and twice He says, this is my beloved Son. At the baptism of Jesus, He says, this is my beloved Son. At the transfiguration here, He says this as well. And then there's a time of suffering in which in this time of suffering God says that that His name will be glorified again in John 12, 28. He says it will be glorified and it has been glorified and it will be glorified again. And this is after the triumphant entry and that time of Christ coming in to Jerusalem. But what is the instruction that he gives? Because not only is Jesus proclaimed divine, but the Father in heaven has a divine instruction for us. He says, this is my beloved Son. And what does he say? Listen to him. That means every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, that proceeds from Christ Jesus, is to be obeyed, is to be listened to, is to be entreated for us in our lives, and we should understand exactly who He is. And we should study His Word. And we should read what He has said, what He has spoken, what He has taught. God has given us this command. Now, it might have sounded like it was only for Peter, John, and James. And they were saying, okay, yeah, we'll listen to Him. We've been listening to Him for three years. But what had he been speaking about specifically? And he would continue to speak about in this context. What was he speaking about that they did not understand? And it said this in verse 9. And they were coming down from the mountain, and he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what is the rising... what the rising from the dead, means. What were they to listen to? His talk on resurrection. His talk on the divine power of Jesus Christ to raise again from the dead, not only himself, but all who will follow him. They didn't get it. It, What's he even talking about, raising from the dead? Go ahead. Oh, that was my uh, symbol for God the Father speaking to them. We got that. Go, Go ahead to the next one. And then we get to this. Jesus is the Son of Man. Remember that Son of Man that I read? With power and authority? This together proves that this is the Son of Man. He even says, until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. Jesus identifying Himself as the very one who is the prophecy of Messiah. The one that will have all of this power and dominion with Him. And he's basically telling them, guys, I'm going to die, but I'm coming back. And what you have seen in this moment, what you have seen, hold fast and don't tell anyone. Don't tell them until I've risen from the dead. Then all of this will make sense. My divine glory shining forth, how I could even rise from the dead. That that ability to overcome death. It'll all make sense. Elijah 
Elijah is the question on the hearts of the, of the disciples at this moment, though. Well, wait a second. Didn't they say that Elijah was supposed to come first? And Jesus goes on in verse 12. He said, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how it is written of the son, how is it written of the Son of Man that he should also suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come. Who's he talking about when he says Elijah has come? John the Baptist. John the Baptist was in the spirit of Elijah. Jesus said he is the greatest of prophets. Well, why would he be the greatest? Because he was the last to come right before the Messiah who had been promised and all of the prophets had been looking for. Elijah has come, he told them. But look at how they treated him. Here was the one that was supposed to restore, who was supposed to be the one to to open the way for the, for the Messiah to tread upon the earth, and they did whatever they pleased to him. What ended up happening to John the Baptist, his head was cut off. And so Jesus brings it back to this idea. So if he suffered, then what is it for the, man, the Son of Man? Isn't it spoken of him that he must suffer many things and be treated with contempt? Jesus turns back to the law and the prophets and the Psalms and and points to the long understanding of Messiah that he would be a suffering servant. Though he was also king, he would be a suffering servant. Isaiah 53. But he is the Son of Man who will rise from the dead. Go ahead and click to the next one. Not only will he suffer as we know that he's about to do upon the cross. In fact, this is only a few weeks away from the, from the very triumphant entry and then into the week of uh, his suffering and his betrayal and, and soon those 24 hours in which soon he would be upon a cross and be crucified. Why am I bringing this up as well? Because we're leading into a a study that is going to begin when I get back after going away on study leave this next week. I'm going to get back and in two weeks we're going to start reading the phrases of Christ upon the cross and studying those. In anticipation for and moving towards Resurrection Sunday. When the fullness of Jesus' glory is shown in the truth of His power as He stands and He is alive again. Many times as we study the Scriptures, it's for application and we're looking for application in our lives and thinking, okay, Lord, how do I go outside today and I, and I serve You and I, and I serve my family and, and what the pastor said today, okay, that stays with me, I can do that But I want you to be wary of that always being the case when you're coming to study God's Word. If you're always looking for how it's going to improve your actions and your words and your attitudes, we might be slipping a little bit into moralism, all right? Sometimes we have to just sit on the fact that we now understand something about Christ Himself that we never knew before. And we just have to meditate on who He is and just let Him in His person be more and more part of us in our lives. And that's why I drew, drew us to the transfiguration this morning. Because He is the very source of divine glory. He is, the very, he is Himself proclaimed to be divine and He is the very Son of Man. He is Messiah. And in that moment at the transfiguration, he showed completely his power and his truth. But we know this, that even if he has to suffer, as he proclaims he will, it will only be for the purpose of the glory of God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your living word. It gives us understanding into the truth of who Jesus Christ is. Thank you that He was transformed before these three men. And as he was transformed, 
so too do we get a glimpse of his glory as it is proclaimed in, his wor- in your word, Lord. That we understand how, how purposeful Jesus was in even showing this to them. To show them that he has the power to rise from the dead because he is God himself. Lord, let that sit in our hearts and minds as we understand the divinity of the true ultimate power of Christ. And let us live in you and thank you for inviting us to be in relationship with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's sing together a song as we leave and let's glorify God with our voices. Forever I will love you, Lord. Forever I will serve you, Lord. Forever I am yours, O Lord. And I will not turn back. Let's together sing. be to the one who has given us his own son greater glory in to the one who has come and given us himself and the father has exalted him his name above all other names that at the name of jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is lord to the glory of the father Now may we go from this place giving glory to the Son in all that we do. May the Lord shine upon you in His goodness. And may you radiate His glory to all of those around. Let's go, brothers and sisters, and serve the Lord in the mission field. God bless you this morning.